The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Office Ergonomics for the Workplace and Remote Workers, presented by our sponsor, Heffernan. We're so happy you can join us. My name is Amanda Ramatar and I will be your moderator today. And I will also be monitoring questions you may have during the session. Before we open up the session, let's review a couple of key items. All of the webinar materials we discuss can be found at the URL currently showing on your screen. I will be sharing this URL in a follow-up email, so don't feel like you need to write it down right now. If you have trouble with your internet connection during the webinar, we recommend leaving the presentation and logging back in. We do not control the audio, your devices control the audio. So if you have audio difficulties, try adjusting the volume settings on your device. If a telephone line goes dead during the call, hang up and call back again to the same number. If all lines go dead, watch the on-screen chat box for an alternative call-in number. Feel free to ask questions or provide feedback by using the chat box or questions box during the webinar. If you are using a tablet, you may need to tap on the screen for the options bar to appear, then you can select the appropriate option. We may not respond immediately, but we will work your questions or feedback into the presentation. If we can't get to your comment or question during the session, we will be online afterwards to respond, or we may follow up in an email if we run completely out of time. You may also email us at moderator at aspenrmg.com for up to 48 hours after the webinar. This will be a one hour presentation. Questions and comments are very much encouraged throughout and the presenters will be answering questions at the end. And lastly, we have a number of upcoming webinars covering a variety of topics, including those at the Heffernan webinar website. In addition, we are offering the mandatory preventing harassment training in English on June 20th this year. With that, let's begin today's webinar, Office Ergonomics for the Workplace and Remote Workers. Our presenters today are Steve Thompson and Diane Probert. Steve integrates a holistic approach to workplace safety for the past <clears throat> for the past 20 years, he has been actively consulting, uh, teaching, and coaching safety, ergonomics, and risk management. He has served in various capacities, including risk manager, safety and health manager, and business development coach and facilitator. He is the co-author of Workplace Safety, a guide for small and mid-sized companies, and is co-author of both safety and ergonomics chapters in Foundation for Optimal Productivity, DMEC, and Tools of the Trade, DMEC. Earlier in his career, Steve served in the Air Force as a medic and later worked as an emergency room nurse. In addition to his role at Aspen Risk Management Group, he is involved with several charitable causes, including the Insurance Industry Charitable Foundation. Diane is an experienced safety professional with expertise in remote ergonomic ass assessments. As a certified office ergonomics analyst, she has provided assessments for people working from home, those in traditional offices, and even people traveling for a living. She is also involved in the training of ergo healthy coaches and the QC process. Thank you both for being with us today. My on. pleasure, Amanda. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, hello everyone. Uh, Happy New Year, 2023. Really, really great to be here. Diane, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm looking forward to giving some great information with you today. It's a great way to start the new year in ergonomically sound positioning. Yeah, we're kicking off the year and we've got a new presentation uh, that we haven't done before for our Heffern and friends and audience. So uh, you'll see some familiar items but we we revamped everything to to start off today uh we'll, we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about remote we'll talk about in uh, in office which is more of the rage uh, today about people coming back into the office uh, and then everything in between so i'm going to go ahead and uh, take my camera off for now so that i can focus on my presentation and let me just do that real quickly and then i'm going to go ahead and start the presentation and let me double check the audience view to make sure that we're okay. All right, we are good to go. 
So thanks everyone, and thanks thanks Amanda for opening things up today. I really appreciate that, and uh, really glad to be here today, especially this first webinar of 2023. We have been uh, working with the Heffernan team since 2006, uh, quite a few years, and we've been presenting webinars for uh, most of that time. So we're really happy to to be part of the Heffernan family and being delivering delivering today's webinar. So our agenda will cover a lot within an hour, and we're, we're going to cover some basic anatomy and physiology. We'll talk about this musculoskeletal disorders and all sorts of stuff, including how you would conduct your own self-assessment for your workstation, or if you're doing it for someone else. So that we're gonna to cover today, and we'll, we'll go through that. So whether you're working remotely or you're working uh, solo remotely, or you're working in an office, or you're hybrid. Uh, by the way, that closed JAMA's over there, that is uh, was coined by one of our uh, employees' daughters who was working, doing schoolwork from home, and she said, I'm gonna stay in my closed JAMA's today. So we already went through the agenda. Let's first talk about some of what our expectations are today. Uh, the expectation of doing an assessment, whether it's self or otherwise, is to make a person more comfortable in the, in the work environment. Uh, it's not a magic wand. There are some things that have to be done in ergonomics to get yourself uh, to feeling good. And we'll talk a lot about neutral postures um, because that ends up being perhaps one of the more um, you know, negative issues that occur in, in, in ergonomics. But we have a polling question for you right off the bat. We would like to um, get a sense of uh, you telling us a little bit about yourself. So if you can, polling question number one, Amanda, would be for the audience to tell us just a little bit about themselves. And really would like to know whether you work from home, uh, you know, virtual most of the time, or do you work from a traditional office most of the time? Now, if you're 50-50 right in the middle, well, you're gonna have to try to come up with which one is is you know a little bit more common for you. Uh, maybe that's a hybrid. So we like to get ourselves to about uh, you know uh, almost up to a minute of voting. But it looks to me like uh, we have a great audience today, Amanda. So we can go ahead and close out this poll if you wouldn't mind, and then we'll have show the results to everybody. Wow, okay, so 41% of you are working hybrid right now, and then it's evenly split between home and a traditional office. So uh, for all of you that are here today, you're at the right place at the right time. Great, thanks a lot, Amanda. You can give this, close that poll out for me. Great. We do have another question for you, and Amanda, we'd like to run that next question if you wouldn't mind. We'd like to know what, people think what you think about your ergonomic knowledge. Where do you rate yourself? Do you feel that you're an awesome expert? Are you about average? Uh, could you use some improvement? Or you're in your early stages just learning about ergonomics? So we just take a moment to do that. And, uh, and Diane and Amanda, we've got a great audience today. I mean, we have uh, just a quick, quick voting. I mean, it's remarkable of how good everyone is doing today. So. Uh, it looks like we're just about there, um, Amanda, if you can close this poll and we'll show our, the results to everybody. So 42% a little improvement and 18% in the early stages and we have some awesome experts on the line. Awesome experts, we would love to get your feedback in the question or chat box, whatever you have on your screen as things go through. So thank you so much everybody for participating and being a part of that. Okay, we can close that poll out, Amanda. Okay. So the rules, uh, let's, let's talk about ergonomics from a science perspective. There is certainly science involved. There is, uh, you know, engineering involved, but the rules are flexible because everyone's different. Everyone's built different. Everyone is, is uh, unique uh, in that way. We now look at things like moving and fidgeting and readjusting as a normal part of being in the office, which is before we'd say you're going to sit in one spot for long periods of time, and that's where you, you know, that's where you sit for the whole day. Uh, it's important that posture be 
fully integrated in your work, taking posture breaks, and even things like alternating your mouse, which you've heard from us before. A little bit about the anatomy and physiology. Uh, we wanted to just share with you a little bit about what your, because a lot of people use their hands and arms and obviously in er er ergonomics, especially in uh, office environments, just take a look at the way that hand is uh, made and you can see tendons and muscles, bones, nerves, and the blood supply. This just gives you a, an overview of, of what this looks like and uh, we'll talk a little bit about what these various things do. We also have tendons and ligaments and that tends to be something where, where you know, that um, these connect to the bones typically and they act like a hinge really more than anything. They limit the range of motion um, ligaments can also tear. You've probably heard of that. Uh, that can occur. Typically not so much in the wrist, but more so in the knees is where you hear that happening. And then we have muscles that we'll just go over very quickly. These are the things that provide strength to your body. They serve as a, a protective layer. Um, they usually run in the same uh, direction. And of course, if you want to build your muscles up larger, you have to break them down. You have to harm them. You have to crush them. You have to uh, do damage to them. Like if you go to the gym or you begin some exercise program, that's the only way to make them swell and to get bigger. The spine is a pretty big topic, which comes up frequently. And we like to show the different uh, vertebral problems that exist. And over on the right-hand side of this slide, you can see some of the different conditions. And most people, when they reach a certain age, are going to have some degenerative disc, uh, you know, problems. And if you've been to the doctor ever and you've had an x-ray, they'll say maybe you have some aging discs or some aging changes within your spine. It's not abnormal to have some uh, degenerative um, conditions. Uh, you can even get the formation of little calcium builds up called osteophytes, which can certainly cause pain um, and loss of motion. So these are important to care for. And if we were in person, we'd actually have a spine that we would show you. There are some disorders that are more common as it relates to work-related injuries. Um, and these are things like what they call the musculoskeletal disorders, MSDs. Uh, they also called cumulative trauma, repetitive stress. Again, those are what, what's we common. I would say common, but you know, they're not, they're, they're curable as they say, but they're, they're more common. Carpal tunnel syndrome. We have a book that, that one of our consultants and, uh, and Ergo Healthy Coaches published many years ago called um, Heal Your Carpal Tunnel Pain Without Surgery. And I've participated in surgical procedures where I've actually been in the surgical suite watching these types of surgeries in the past. And it's always interesting to see that uh, sometimes these problems that happen in the wrist may actually come from further up, like starting in the neck or otherwise. So it's important to control uh, these types of, uh, you know, medical problems, and they can be managed quite easily by a certain set of, you know, practices, which we'll cover today. These are just some of the symptoms that people can feel uh, as it relates to carpal tunnel. We'll go through them all. They're very common. Another common uh, medical problem is tendonitis. That's where you have inflammation of the tendons. And this can happen at any time, whether you're pulling or texting or twisting. And Diane will talk a little bit about that later on and the types of work that's done and how that can happen. But tendonitis can cause everything from joint uh, problems and limitations to pain. Uh, some people have, you've heard of uh, tennis elbow or other types of conditions where you have uh, inflammation in your tendons, and it can be quite pains even when you're gripping or otherwise. And then there are other aspects of ergonomics where things of, um, you have risk factors, and those are things all the way from contact stress, and we'll share some of these images with you later on. Awkward postures, environmental factors, like if it's three below zero and you're working in an office, certainly that would be of concern and of a problem. 
contact stress, as we just mentioned, is one of those things that happens uh, just by pressure, that's all. And it can happen to all different areas of the body, including the fingers and the palms, et cetera. Awkward postures happen, especially in sedentary. And we're gonna show you a little bit about what some of those awkward postures look like. Here's a work setup that certainly has, you know, all sorts of, um, you know, awkward postures that exist. There's pressure and force that can exist, and that is uh, those things that we don't do too much of anymore, like stapling and hole punching, um, even putting stamps on. But there are things that can create pressure and force. Generally, the use of a mouse is not pressure or force because it's such a minor. Same thing with keyboard. And then there are uh, in individual health factors, and that is, take a look at the arm on the right-hand side. Uh, if you put your arms down at your side with your palms facing forward, does your arm slightly bend out to the right or does it go straight down? Uh, that can be just a matter of what, uh, the way you're built. Uh, we know that cigarette smoking and vaping um, is a vasoconstrictor, so that can lead to uh, pain in a, um, an area that may um, be uh, prone to injury or has been injured in the past. And then things that, uh, you know, body mass index and certain musculoskeletal disorders all can play a factor in it. And then the lack of activity, of course, or overexertion too, can increase uh, susceptibility to injury. There are environmental factors, we talked about that earlier, including lighting and noise and other types. Can also be things like having old equipment in a new environment or all sorts of things that can occur, including misinformation. This is sort of a risk factors that occur in the office. We put them all together in one graphic here so you get to see them all in one shot. And by the way, this presentation will be available to everybody once we're done. These are the types of injuries that occur in the office. If you take a look at them, slips and falls are typically the, the top one, then strains and then uh, punctures of some sort. And then there are people that work in an office that might have to go to the bank or make other trips, so motor vehicles. Motor vehicle incidents are the leading cause of death in the workplace. Uh, that's the one thing that we still have not been able to manage very well. Um, but you can see slips and falls and strains usually rank at the very high end for office or clerical environments. So we're gonna talk a little bit about conducting a workstation assessment, whether it's yours or you're doing it for somebody else. Uh, but we have a polling question for you, if we can launch that for us. Tell us a little bit about the equipment that you use. Uh, we already found out uh, the type, of, the amount of time you spend, i.e. whether it's hybrid or otherwise, but we'd like to know which of these items, and you can answer all of them, or just one of them, or uh, we wanna know uh, the types of items that you use for work and uh, whether that's a uh, laptop only or it's a laptop or a computer with you know a monitor and a keyboard uh, smartphones or otherwise and again great audience thank you very much for pulling this together for us we really appreciate that uh, let's go ahead and close this one out amanda we have a great response so almost 90 percent of our audience today is using a computer laptop with external stuff and then 14% laptops only. So we won't spend too much time on that. We'll go through that quickly. 70% using a smartphone. That's the highest we've seen uh, even over 2022. That's pretty remarkable. And then we'd love to hear you put something in the chat box or question box and tell us what the other is. Maybe it's a smartwatch or something like that, but we'd love to hear what that is. Okay, we can go ahead and hide that. Um, okay, and then we have one other question for you. What position do you work at most of the day? Are you seated using an office type chair uh, at a desk or are you seated using an office type? And you gotta try to get the most correct one. There, this is not a multiple choice one. This is where we're asking you to try and describe, you know, your typical um, office environment um, that you do most of the time. So Amanda, we can go ahead and close this out. We've got a great uh, audience again. 83% are seated using some sort of office chair, and then it's sprinkled of uh, some percentages about doing some other things. Again, we'd love to hear that 1% other, that would be terrific. 
with that, I'm going to turn over this next step, uh, next section of our presentation to Diane. Diane, are you there? I am. Thank you, Steve. So we are going to talk about the four areas of focus. So the majority of you are sitting at a traditional type of setup with a traditional, um, hopefully ergonomic chair. So that's awesome. And this is just a nice slide to just kind of show you, you know, the basics. And now we're just going to go through the five steps plus the pre steps. So the first thing we want to start with is when you're sitting at your desk, uh, you're going to be sitting in a chair. And that's what we are going to start with is to take a look at the kind of chair that you're sitting in. Is it good positioning? Is it the right size for you? All chairs are not meant for everyone, right? Some of us are really tall. Some of us are shorter. Some of us are really thin. Some of us might have a little extra. So we want to make sure that it's um, a good size for you. And you want to make sure that um, it's also going to be functional. So does it have some lumbar support for you? Is the depth of the seat good for how tall you are? And one thing I like to say is if you all could just reach down and take your hand and see how many fingers worth of space you have between the front of your chair and the back of your knee. And you can see Steve there is circling it down on the bottom right. We like to say that we want to have about three to four fingers worth. So if you have a lot more, then you may need to sit back. You may need a little bigger chair and vice versa. So just kind of see how um, how you're feeling in your chair and is it a right fit for you. So then the first step, uh, once we have that chair, we're going to look at it and see is it adjusted properly at the right height so that you can get in good positioning for your upper body. So you want to say you want to have what we would call a close to a 90 degree angle of your upper body and your arm. So I like to think about it as your ear, your shoulder, and your elbow in one line, and then your elbow, your wrist, and your hand in another line. So you want it kind of like an L. Sometimes I see people that are leaning back too far and stretching out to reach their keyboard. You want to get those elbows back and close to your side. So that may entail you needing to raise up your chair or lower your chair. Just depends on again your positioning what kind of a depth you're working for things like that then the second step is we're going to look at the lower half of your body so now you've got your chair up and you're in good positioning in the upper but now maybe your legs or feet are dangling so you don't want that again you want to get those 90 degree angles so we want the hips and the knees on the same plane and then you want to be in a squatting position with your feet supporting you so if you're Feet don't touch the ground. Um, you want to maybe add a footrest. If you don't have a footrest, you could add some paper ream, some books, so that you um, are feeling supported. A lot of times I'll see people can't get their feet on the ground, so they have it on the rung of the chair. That's not ideal because then you're kind of backwards and you've got now your feet um, behind your. So just kind of think about it as a squatting position, and then you slide that chair underneath you. And then the step three for that chair is take a look at the back positioning of your chair. You can use it for support. You can see the lady on the left. She's using it to support her back again to have um, an, a nice posture. And then you can see over here on the right, we've got Steve. I call him abs of steel because he's sitting up away from the back of his chair. And that's fine. But for some of us that don't have such great core strength, you might need to use the back of that chair for support. Um, so that you don't start kind of hunching over. And it's okay to go back and forth. Just make sure that when you do use the back of your chair that it's, it's in a good positioning as well. And then step four, take a look at your monitor. So now you maybe you raised up your chair and now maybe your monitors are going to be too low. So you want to be able to look straight ahead and have this neutral position that we're focusing on so that you don't have to bend your neck down or up to see the majority of your screen. So we usually, I like to ask people just look straight ahead and tell me what part of your screen do you see, your monitor. And you, and then between that, you know, be about the top third, so you know, where your main majority of your work is. And then as far as distance, you just wanted a comfortable distance. There's no exact measurement for that. I would say that the larger your screen is, kind of like your television, the bigger it is, probably a little bit further away you want to be. And then you want to have your keyboard and your mouse centered in front of that monitor and your body. Sometimes I'll see people in their setup and then the monitor, if they're just using one monitor, it's over to the side. 
meaning they're going to have to tilt their neck to the side a lot to look at it. You want to be kind of straight in front of it. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the monitors. Some people are using dual monitors, some people even three monitors. Maybe you're using your laptop as a second monitor, and that's fine. It's just a matter of getting it all set up, no matter how many monitors you're using, in the correct positioning for you. So if you look at a single monitor position, again, you want everything in directly in front and just lined up so that you can look straight ahead and not have to bend your neck a lot to turn to look at it. If you're using two, two monitors, it depends a lot on if you're using them both equally. So some people use uh, two, two monitors to click and drag, so they're using both of them. Then you want to be set up pretty much like in the middle of the two so that you can just glance to the left or the right if you need to. If you're using one a lot less than the other one, maybe for some just instant messages, something like that, then you want to be set up a little bit more in front of the one that you're using the most and have the other one over onto the side. And then I talked about if you're going to use your monitor from your laptop as your second screen, that's fine as well. But you want to get that up on some type of a riser so that it's somewhat equal to the larger external monitor that you're using. Again, what I commonly find is someone using their laptop just right on their desk. So it's a lot lower than the monitor on their desktop. So that means they have to turn bend their head down, look at it, go back up. And then we don't want to try to eliminate that. And then for the laptop only, there was some of you that are using a laptop only. Um, I encourage you to get a laptop riser, external keyboard and mouse, so that you can again be in better positioning. Because what happens if you just use your laptop alone and you're typing on your laptop, then you're gonna have some issues. So you see here with the laptop only, again, our model Steve, is showing it, you know, he's using it on his lap. He's using a little um, cushion device so that it's not right on his legs, which is really good because I have had a, a case where someone did burn their leg with the laptop on, using their laptop directly on their legs for an entire shift. Not a great idea. Um, and again, you wanna do this, I wouldn't suggest this positioning for your entire day. You know, for a mid two to four hours, something like that, you want to send your uh, laptop back, the screen back a little bit so that you can see more of it. And then again, here's another example. This lady is wearing um, bifocals, so you can see she doesn't have to put her screen quite as much because she's going to be looking down, right, through the bottom half of her glasses. And so that's fine. Um, she's in pretty good positioning. But again, you're going to give up something. So if you get your arms in a good positioning, then you are going to have to probably bend your neck down to look at that. And after a while, that could cause some issues. So if you are going to do that, I suggest you limit the amount of laptop and take a lot of breaks when you're, you're doing that. And then here's some com common monitor positioning mistakes. Again, you see the two laptop, the laptop and then the screen right in front of each other. That's not great because um, again, you're looking down, then you're looking up. So you're just, and, you know, repetitively tilting your head up and down. It's better to put it to the side and raise it up. And then if you put your monitor in front of your window, you're going to see it have a lot of glare, and you're going to have that light coming in at you. So that could cause some of those issues that Steve talked about earlier about environmental issues that could, you know, trigger some squinting, some eye issues, maybe headaches, things like that. So be mindful of where in your office you're setting it up as well. And then just another example of a bifocal user, wait up the screen so that he's got to tilt his head back to be able to look through the bottom of his glasses. So that would be better to be going down and not up so high. <clears throat> And then the ideal monitor height, again, you can see um, the difference of the height between a bifocal and a non-bifocal, because if you're not using bifocals and you either just have straight vision glasses or no glasses at all, you're pretty much going to look straight ahead. And with the bifocal user, again, you're going to be looking down, so you're going to want a positioning, again, whether you're using your glasses or not, either way, you want to be able to see the majority of your screen where your work is without having to bend your neck up or down. That's the biggest thing to think about. So when you're looking at your monitor, say, am I bending my neck a lot? Yes, I am. Okay, that means that maybe I need to adjust that monitor. 
And then the last step is step number five. We made it, guys, through all five. Again, we want to eliminate that awkwardness next posture. So some people maybe uh, take notes during um, team meetings, things like that. You come back, you want to look at those notes, make some um, notes, transcribe them onto your computer. You want to maybe use a document holder if you are going to be doing that a lot because, again, you have to look down if you have it flat. You can see here she's using a tilt board. Those are good for when you have a large set of documents, maybe a book, notebook, something like that. If you have just a single page, maybe two or three pages, I like the kind that clip right onto the side of your monitor because, again, you don't have to look down at all. You're just glancing over to the left or to the right wherever you put it. And so that concludes our five steps. I'm going to turn it over to Steve, who's going to give us some information about what about if you're using a standing workstation, Steve? Thank you, Diane, very much. I uh, wanted to go quickly through this because we have not a lot of folks doing this. But just one thing to keep in mind is that everything from the waist up is the same if you're doing uh, standing work. The only thing that's different is the stuff that's below the waist. So as long as you get everything set for the upper extremities above the waist, you're doing well. A couple things. Uh, the reason that uh, uh, bars have what's called a bar rail down there at the bottom is that you'll stay a long time. So when you use something like a uh, small item to put your foot up on, you notice that you can stay a lot longer because it re reduces the pain, uh, pressure in your lower back and your hips. And so therefore, if you've ever waited in line for a ticket or spent a long time waiting for a ride to go on, uh, you'll know that if you could elevate one of those feet, you'd do a lot better. So if you're doing any kind of standing work, you want to do the same thing. And by the way, we have all these materials available for, for all of you. So you're not going to walk away from the session without having these materials. Uh, if you do standing work, uh, we recommend following the Cornell University Dr. Hedge approach. They've done 30 or 40 research studies on office work. And uh, one of the things that's that's pretty neat about it is that they, they look at a 30 minute period. It isn't like you stand for two hours, sit for two hours, sit stand for two hours, because you're going to be standing is sedentary, so is sitting. So really what they recommend if you're going to do standing work is 20 minutes of sitting, eight minutes of standing and then two minutes of moving around. So the reality is if you're going to do a sit, sitting job, uh, you, you, want to, you want to sit for about 50 minutes, take a five minute break, get up, move around, do the same thing. You don't really want to, if you can only stretch in your seat, that's fine, uh, but be much better to get up and, and move around. So that's the Cornell University approach and we believe it works great. A lot of times you know, people go to the doctor they say get a sit-stand workstation, but they don't say how to use it. Uh, of course, it depends on certain medical conditions too, but this is the preferred and approach to it. Um, if you're going to do your own self-assessment, we're going to include this also. These are the types of questions that we think are good to use. Uh, and you can see things like what kind of work do you use? Are you right or left-handed? Do you wear glasses or contacts? Do you have a discomfort? Um, do you do any kind of exercises? Did you have any exercises in the past? Do you do any gaming or otherwise? Facebook, all of those kinds of things, because they all contribute to sedentary, you know, activities other than exercise routines. So we'll include the, the questions uh, and the assessment as part of the handouts. Uh, these are the kind of things that we generally ask for when we do an assessment. We want to know um, uh, how a person is sitting in their seat, what does the general uh, environment look like. Uh, these are the things that we look at in order to be able to do a remote assessment. So if you have people that are working remote, not traditional office, we ask these kinds of questions. Are you doing, you know, where are you working? So these are the things that we look for. Now 40% of work comp costs uh, equate to musculoskeletal disorders. And so you see the same thing in the office environment, even though slip trips and falls are number one, you do see that musculoskeletal disorders lead that. We had participated in a study years ago, and it's not just the cost of work comp, it's the decrease in productivity. Uh, Cisco and Accenture are large um, consulting firms, and they wanted to improve productivity for their workforce. And they found that people who were in consistently high levels of pain they would basically pull off task or they would have to, you know, 
do something out of the ordinary to either rub their muscle or do whatever, move around, stretch. And this re re resulted in many hours of work lost and even up to 13 hours per, per week uh, per employee. So once you introduce uh, an ergonomic assessment process and you make things better, you get decreases in reported discomfort and you get decreases in the number of cases that are filed for ergonomic injuries. Now, there are some problems. I know that no one on our audience uh, uh, reads their phones or tablets or otherwise in this particular position. But if you did, we would want to uh, make sure that uh, you, know, you don't do that. I'm gonna skip this polling question and just jump right into uh, the impact of some sedentary events. The people working in, in, in an office environment, it's a sedentary workforce for the most part. And if you're working remotely, uh, that's even a higher incidence because uh, the, you know, a lot of people that are working remotely are spending their time sitting for longer periods of time, um, although there is commute time, which would be considered sitting also. Uh, this is usually not people don't pay attention to sedentary work because it's not, doesn't get the big, you know, I fell off a building. I'm not being, um, I'm not being um, facetious here. What I'm saying is that it doesn't get the sort of press um, that, that other high type of incidents would occur. Um, there's also been a huge explosion of social networking and communication. I don't care which one you're on. There are Facebook has what almost two billion members. Uh, LinkedIn, four to six hundred million. Twitter, who knows what they are anymore. Uh, YouTube has a well over a billion website visitors per month. So there's a lot of activity that's happening relating to sedentary activities. And take a look at gaming. If you've got a gaming uh, device in your home or on your phone, just take a look at the the numbers here. Fifty eight percent of Americans play some sort of game. Um, and uh, the average American household has at least one dedicated game console. So just that's the age of people who are participating in, in gaming. The reason that we look at all this stuff in addition to the work environment is because uh, if we only looked at things from work, then we would be in a whole world of hurt because reality is we only spend 24% of our time at work. So if we don't analyze things away from work, we're missing a whole part of what we do. And today it's more important to know about what we're doing outside of work. So let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that we see are problematic. Here's uh, one of our consultants showing us what it's like to be uh, twisting, feet not on the ground, probably not a good environment to be. That is not a product placement for that in the background. But alcohol may impair your work product, so uh, be be aware of that. Um, it's also identifying that you want to use a risk support not quite that firm. Uh, we showed this earlier about one of our staff members sitting at the uh, bar, and of course you can see that that's not a great work environment. Arms are pulled forward, shoulders stretched forward, uh, knees are going to bounce into the to the back of the wall there, and probably wearing the watch a little bit too tight. Uh, remember, those are things that swell up at the end of the day. Uh, the classic thinker today, obviously a problem hunched over. Uh, this causes back problems, maybe to start the movie, but only for a few seconds. Here's a stretched out arm in sort of a traditional environment with a too small of a keyboard tray underneath the desk. It only doesn't allow for the mouse to be on there. Not good. There's that contact stress we talked about earlier. You can see how that pressure is being put there. I guess the watch is offering a little bit of protection on the other side. Here we have Joe Wall Street. Uh, remember, go, uh, nicotine can uh, be a vasoconstrictor, so that can be problematic if you've got predisposition to uh, or past injury somewhere. But you can see all the problems with this. And as Diane said earlier, the laptop is right on the legs. So some people are concerned about EMF, which is electromagnetic uh, fields or radiation. And uh, that, that is a problem with some people uh, don't wanna deal with. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, granted that is a, a lactose-free milk, but you can see the pressure on the right uh, forearm and the left elbow. 
not a good position to be in for long periods of time. Looks good on screen, but certainly not very good. There's a modern TV tray here in the center, and these are, uh, well, they were relatively inexpensive. I don't know what they are today. Fold up, if you've got a small apartment working from home. Uh, here we have uh, the old TV trays from 1956, but the new TV tray uh, brought forward into time. And uh, you can see that this, cons this uh, individual is using their leg to hold it steady. And this probably works for an hour or two. This is not something you want to do for long periods of time. Again, if you want to, if you're concerned about EMF or EMR, whether it's your phone, tablet, or other device, I mean, even Bluetooth, you know, devices that you wear in your ears, uh, the best way to use a laptop is to just unplug it and use it without Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. So if you download all your emails from somewhere else, uh, you won't get the same impact. Uh, again, uh, you want to reduce the heat because that's prob that's a problematic in that. In that. We talked about, uh, we saw this picture before, why it's important to use, uh, you know, some sort of support underneath that laptop. And then Judge Judy there attempting to open her laptop, having all sorts of problems. Uh, we talked about this positioning before. Talked about using keyboards and mouse devices, we generally recommend a smaller keyboard for most people. Now you can see the difference in this keyboard is that there's no number keys on the right hand side, which means that when you use your mouse on the right hand, that it's closer into your body because that extra three to four or five inches where the number keys are can be, you know, just adds that space on. So, so there are plenty of of keyboards made this way and they're about 20 20 bucks or so to get them and uh it but if you are a person who uses 10 key a lot and you do entry it might be okay to have the the 10 key on there or you can get a separate 10 key that you can pull down when you're doing a lot of key key 10 key entries uh, remember taking that stretch break every hour one of those critical aspects uh, here we see a traditional work environment and this person's rotating their mouse between the right and left hand remember rotate your mouse every 30 days um, and you know it's going to take you about 48 hours to adjust to using the opposite hand for your mouse and make it into a left mouse or a right mouse you can you can go into the into the settings and change your mouse from you know the, so that the uh, the right button is now the left button and so it'll operate exactly the same doesn't take long to get that working well. Let's talk quickly about cell phones. Again, we talked about earlier, hopefully no one on this call is operating in this way, but there are some ways to beat this, and that is you can hold your phone up. Now, when you hold your phone or tablet up in these, as you can see in the photos, you're going to get an automatic trigger from your shoulders and your arms, and it's going to say, I'm getting tired, I need a rest. And that's a great time to be able to find a different position. Uh, if you bend your neck down like this, you never get the warning really until it's too late where it really hurts a lot. These are better solutions. And as you can see in these photos, these are people promoting or propping up uh, their, their phones. Uh, Diane, I'm gonna turn it over to you at this point in time because I know that you like talking about that photo on the lower right side. I love that photo. You know, uh, I like to say it doesn't take a rocket scientist to say that uh, which positioning do you think that she's going to feel better in for an extended period of time. Um, you can clearly see on the right, she has good posture. Uh, her neck is, you know, a lot better positioning than on the left. And because she's holding up her phone, she's going to start getting fatigued, right? And so then that's going to trigger her to move. Um, and get into a different position. Whereas on the left, she might be there quite a while before her neck starts hurting and then she realizes, oh, you know, she shouldn't be doing that. And again, it's just um, it's just better to do this on shorter periods of time. You know, we've all seen the YouTube videos where someone's looking down at their phone while they're walking and the next thing you know, they fall into a hole or something like that. And, you know, you don't want to be the next a viral sensation of um, of a silly mishap while reading your cell phone. And then the other thing that I would say um, to just kind of wrap up the best practices, um, take a short break between the times that you're using your phone. 
And I know um, a lot of us might be scrolling, either you're scrolling through, um, you know, something on your social media or scrolling through to read certain feeds, maybe on LinkedIn, something like that. Um, just like we're talking about changing your mouse, also change your hand so that um, you're scrolling, you know, with your left hand for a while and then your right hand. And if you can um, limit, you know, your time that you're texting and things like that with your hands in an awkward position, you could use text to speech, uh, use your speaker phone or a headset. Don't cradle that phone, you know, um, on your neck between your ear and your shoulder so that you have to tilt your neck and um, support the arm. And then I love this, um, the burden of staring at a smartphone up on the upper right hand side. You can see here every degree that you go down to look increases the burden um, on your neck and your shoulders. And you can see here all the way down to the red, you're now talking about, you know, 55 pounds uh, or an air conditioner. And I, I don't know about you, but I don't think I could hold an air conditioner on my um, back of my head very long. So just keep that in mind and be mindful. Notice yourself. Are you looking down a lot? Take a break. Look up. You know, hold up that phone. Just move a lot um, when you can. And I noticed also on our polling question, some people were using a tablet for work. Same thing as the laptop alone. You might want to get an external keyboard. Lift that up so that you're not looking down at it a lot. And it's scrolling the same thing. Use your left hand and then your right hand. Kind of go back and forth. Thank you, Diane. You know, uh, whether you're self-coaching or you're coaching someone else for ergonomics, this can be difficult. In the old days, an ergonomist would go into a work site, we'd make these changes, and then a week later, people would, put, would change it back to the way it was. And there's lots of reasons why uh, change can be difficult. We don't get into all the psychology. We just know that if you're helping someone else, it's important to provide education. Talk about posture and movement and away from work activities. How often is a person stretching? Is it every hour on the hour? It also takes time to undo uh, injury. So if you've, if you've been using your cell phone for 10 years and you've been scrolling away, like Diane said, and you're starting to develop an elbow or shoulder or pain, it's not gonna go away in a day. You're gonna have to take time to get yourself back into shape again. So the alternating tasks, the stretches, the posture reminders, uh, the break reminders, all that stuff's gonna take time. If you do alternate between the right and left hand, let's say that your right hand is really bothering you. Wouldn't it be nice if every doctor would say, I want you to rest that right hand for the next 30 days and use your left hand for your mouse? Well, that would be the best approach to get that right hand back to shape. Now, your left hand's gonna suffer a little bit. It's probably gonna feel some muscle strain from being forced into the role, but that's why it's good to rotate on a regular uh, basis. Now, most people do improve. We have a polling question, and uh, Amanda, if you can put our next one up, which is the neck position one. Uh, if you can't get to it, I can do that one. Um, now we showed you the graphic earlier that showed what neck positions, you know, the 50, the 60 degrees is the air conditioner and then the neutral is perfect. It's absolutely perfect. And then there's all the way in between. But if you were to make a wild guess as to your, your sort of go-to posture for your neck, when you're looking at your phone or a tablet item, where do you think you're at? It, by the way, we're not grading you and none of this is being, you know, forwarded to, uh, you know, to your employers or, or otherwise. Um, we just, you know, want to get a sense of where you feel that you're at as it relates to your neck posture. And if you want to put your phone in front of you right now and just do your normal thing, where's your neck at? Where do you think it mostly stays? So I'm going to go ahead and close. Oh, we can close this poll. Go ahead, Amanda. We can close this one out and share that with our audience. Thank you for your honesty. We even had some people that were down in the 60 degrees. So I know everybody that was in the 5% or the, uh, the, five, the neutral or the 15 degrees are encouraging you 45ers and 60s and 30s to, to work on your posture and get that back in shape. How do you compare to others? We can close this poll out, Amanda. Thank you very much. And how do you compare? Well, when we ask the rest of the world and we look at 
thousands of people uh, that have responded to this, uh, you can see that it's uh, very, very similar uh, to, to what the rest of uh, your peers are doing. Um, and this is about exactly what we have seen in the last couple of years of data. So thank you for responding and thank you for taking notice in that. Let's talk about if you're working from home or you've returned to the office, but if you, remember we talked earlier about the way people get hurt in an office? Well, it's not just ergonomics. So if you're working from home or doing a hybrid environment, remember your home uh, is going to be uh, different than an office. So you want to use good electrical cords, if surge protector, uh, make sure things are away from your uh, the cords and the protectors and the modems like heaters. Don't keep those around. Uh, keep those trip hazards out of the way. It could be laundry, it could be tools, toys. Maybe you're stuffed down in the, uh, you're up in the attic or you're down in the basement or you're working in the kids room or you're working in your own kitchen table or wherever you're at. You want to try to, you know, keep those areas clear of uh, slip, trip and fall hazards. And if you don't have your smoke detector up to date, it's probably a good time to look at that. And then it's probably time if you're working from home to make sure you've got a fire extinguisher available. So what I'd like to do now as we close up, I'd like you to, uh, we're gonna make, we're gonna hopefully all of you become ergo champs, but what I'd like you to do is take a look at the H, hang the arm straight down at your side. So what I'd like you to do is just take your hands and just rest them down at your side. I'd like to do that for just 10 seconds, not 60, just 10 seconds. Take your arms and just put them down. Let them fully relax at your side. Those of you that are getting that email out or getting that last minute thing, just take your arms, rest them at your side. No, no way, just, just uh, hands uh, facing towards your body. Just hold that for 10 seconds. So I guarantee you when you came out of the, you can lift them up now. When you came out of the womb, you did not come out in this position of typing. You didn't, some of you may have come out like this. Uh, some of you may have come out like this, but you did not come out in the keen position. What I'd like you to think about at least, you can't get up and stretch or otherwise, at least let your arms hang down at your side for 60 seconds. You will get incredible relaxation in your shoulders and your neck just by doing that. So we'd like everybody to take this away. We've created an acronym for ErgoChamp, and certainly uh, all of these factors apply. You can post this in your workstation, give it to your kids, give it to your family members, give it to your coworkers and otherwise. Now, we always like to know how we can improve, and we'd love you to take a moment to do two things. One, in your chat or question box, if you would either enter one takeaway from today, that, you, uh, that you've had from today's session or a question that you may have. If you have a question, certainly ask away. Uh, if you don't have a question, we'd just love to hear at least one takeaway from today. What is one takeaway that you had from today's session? And while that's going on, um, Amanda, I'm gonna ask you to, to take a look at those and read any pertinent ones off to us or, um, or I think that uh, Diane, you can take a look at those too. Uh, that may save Amanda for her voice because she's not feeling very well today. Diane, you can take a look at those. While you're doing that, uh, we're gonna have a lot of good stuff for you, including the self-assessment form, uh, an at-home safety checklist, uh, the stretch and flex, which we love by the Marines. No, you don't have to be a Marine to use it. Um, and then a copy of the 12 steps of self-care, uh, by Kate Montgomery, one of our former consultants, great materials. And then Diane has listed a number of break reminder apps. Let's say you can't remember to take that break. There are a ton of them that you can avail, that get on, on your app store and they can be everything from, you know, in, uh, integrating exercises or just reminding you to take a break. And of course you'll get a copy of the presentation, which we'll be happy to send to you. So Diane, do we have any questions or do we have any feedback from our audience? Oh, we do. Someone did ask about the um, handouts. Uh, we will be sending out an email that will have the handouts um, that Steve just went over and some resources. And uh, the just comments that we have is the importance of posture, hanging your hands down for 60 seconds, taking a break. And um, a lot of uh, the, 
stand, you know, with the routine rather than standing all of the time. And we have someone that puts a box under their laptop, which is awesome, as their second screen. And then um, just, I don't see any actual questions. If anyone does have a question, go ahead and put that in your question box and uh, Steve or I are happy to answer that. Um, someone did say it's funny how even the 10 seconds of resting the arms now just made a difference. Oh, that's great to know. Thank you, Diane. Amanda, if you can run our last polling question, that's just for us. We want to know how we did today uh, and that will just uh, keep keep among us so that we can improve. I want to thank everybody for participating and being a part of today's session. Thank you so much for, for being an engaged audience and uh, for starting off 2023 with, uh, with a strong ergonomic message. Hopefully you can share this with others that you work with, or if you're a manager, you can share it with your staff. Uh, this presentation will be recorded. So in that case, uh, you can go to the Heffern Insight and this recording will be there for the future. So if you wanted to have your employees attend or otherwise, um, I wanna thank you all for taking a moment to vote. We can close that poll, Amanda, but let's not share it with our audience. We're all good. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Amanda, any closing comments? Yeah, I actually have a um, question that just came in. They ask, I'm having some nerve pain in my right elbow and sometimes where I rest, wrist on table, do you think a wrist support would be helpful? Uh, if it's in the elbow, uh, is that where the pro if the problem is in the elbow or in the forearm, uh, a wrist support uh, gel pad may be able to change the dimensions of where you're working. But I'd really, I'd really try to figure out what's causing the actual problem. If it's pressure, like contact, uh, then certainly you'd want to move back. You may have to, you know, increase the size of your fonts in your computer, which is all doable. Um, but really. Uh, you know, if it's if it's in the elbow, that's a different kind of uh, of problem. So it could be, I would start off by doing all of the stretches that we're going to send, and I would also encourage um, those breaks with hanging arms down at the side. Of course, we're going to suggest alternating to the other side, so that if it's on your right arm, that you give that a little bit of a rest, and you use the left hand. Uh, for the mouse or scrolling or otherwise. So I hope that helps. And you can always send us questions by, by email or text or otherwise. So if you have a question and you need something more specific, just be happy to, to email us at, um, at the email address that, um, that'll be in the, in the follow-up. Perfect, and should we, should we address any other questions that we have coming in now, or would you prefer that I sure. send these to you? In sure, a no, that's okay. We're officially done with the presentation. The recording will go right until the very end, but go ahead. Perfect, may as well use our last three minutes. So um, we had someone ask, do you provide consulting services in the workplace? We do, we work closely with the Heffernan team, and we also work with uh, a number of customers as it relates to ergonomics, absolutely. Would you say someone using a recliner in a reclined position with a lap tray for a ergonomic keyboard and mouse with monitors in front and slightly to the side is a good positioning? Hey, you're using a recliner. Well, it depends on how long you're in the recliner. I know that that um, Diane talked a little bit about, you know, unique positionings. Hey, you can work in a recliner if you're comfortable and you got all the things in place. Remember, the stuff that happens above the waist is all pretty much the same. Now, a recliner will change the angle of your back uh, a little bit. So uh, you just have to remember that, you know, you want to be in positions of comfort and neutral postures. If you're in an awkward position where you're reaching up or way, way down with your, with your arms, that becomes problematic. Um, hey, you're welcome to send us a photo of yourself uh, via email and we'll be happy to give you feedback. And I'd also jump in and say, watch your neck positioning as well, because if you're leaning back too far and then you've got to tilt your neck to see your screen, and if right. they're over to the side, you're now tilting your neck to the, twisting your neck to the right or left as well. Right. Does that take care of it, Amanda? Yes, we were able to get through all of our questions. So I just want to thank everybody for attending today's webinar presented by Heffernan. We will send information by email with instructions on how to access a copy of the presentation on our website. Thank you, Steve and Diane, for your time and expertise today. 
and we hope all of the attendees found today's webinar to be a valuable use of time. Be sure to join us on February 7th for our Diversity, Inclusion, and Implicit Bias webinar. So thank you, everybody, and have a safe day. Thank you.